Hello, everyone. I'm Lynn Permondo, and I'm here with Nina Zolotov and Barry Rissman. Nina is the editor in chief and a contributing writer for the Yoga for Healthy Aging blog, and she's co author with Baxter Bell of the very famous book, Yoga for Healthy Aging A Guide to Lifestyle, Lifelong Rather Well Being. She's also the co author with Rodney Yee of two books, Yoga, The Poetry of the Body, and Moving Toward Balance. Her most recently published book is a solo venture called Yoga for Times of Change. A longtime yoga practitioner, teacher, and writer, Nina's particular area of interest besides healthy aging is how to use the tools of yoga to create emotional well being. So, in that vein, she's taught workshops and classes on such topics as sleep, stress management, cultivating equanimity, and more. Barry is also an internationally recognized yoga teacher, public speaker, and author. Her book, Evolving Your Yoga, 10 Principles for Enlightened Practice, is a guide for yoga teachers and practitioners to deepen, expand, and integrate the benefits of their yoga practice into their off-the-mat lives. Barry co-created and is the former co-director of the World Spine Care Yoga Project, World Spine Care Yoga Project, let me say that correctly. The mission there is to bring the benefits of posture, breathing, and mindfulness into the process of pain management, active self-care, and movement to low mobility populations around the world. So ladies, welcome. So great to have you here together. Now I'm gonna go out on a limb here and I'm going to venture to say that between the two of you, we're looking at more than 50 years of yogic practice and wisdom and teaching. Would I be accurate in saying that? And between the three of us, <laughs> 75 years, we're just really, really old over here. <laughs> generations but you like me were I would say I'm going to say fortunate enough to come into the yoga place the place of yoga practice before it became more known as a an alternative to uh, exercise at the gym so when it was a much more holistic practice and we were looking at yoga as more than uh, you know, muscles and, and bones and that sort of thing. Uh, so your practice for both of you, I would say, has been cultivating a holistic sense of the work for, for your students and your, the people who read your books. Uh, is that, would that be pretty accurate that you're both looking for the bigger picture besides the... Um, although we can develop muscles, but really yoga is much more powerful. Is that? I agree with your statement very much, but I think it's worth saying that for me, I did get involved as people so often do as a form of exercise. And when I was only taking a couple of times a week for a class, I wasn't really exposed to the other sides of yoga, to the yoga philosophy, and to an understanding about how the various practices influence our emotional body and our emotional health and uh, so and our attitude towards life. So it was only later that I got into that. So um, I just think there is a natural progression and I like to help people make that natural progression. However they come in. Right. That's right. Well, yeah, that, that I, happened I, to me too. I had a physical practice and then I had a big accident. And then I learned yoga for the first time after practicing for years. Um, Barry, what were you going to say? Yeah, I was going to say that um, for me, I also like, like Nina came to yoga through the physical practice. And <clears throat> in my case, I actually started yoga at a studio that did present it as a spiritual practice. There were candles, there were incense, there were mantras playing, but it really didn't sink in for me until several years later. Like I was doing the physical practice and because I have a naturally flexible body type, I could do all the postures. But what I realized after was that within my internal dialogue, 
there was this habit of self-criticism and judgment and falling short of expectations I set for myself that really didn't change even yeah. when I started doing the yogic postures. So for me, the shift really came when I started learning some of the principles of yoga philosophy that addressed emotional well-being, that I was really able to, um, to, to practice yoga in a way that affected me on the inside in a way that we know is the more authentic yeah. <laughs> and longer lasting um, approach and benefits of the practice. So Nita, you've been really honest in your book with your own uh personal story of how you went through a period, a difficult period in your life, and, and you kind of gravitated to some of these deeper practices. Is that um, something you could share about? Yes, yes. I mean, I, I, I will say that in the beginning when I, I've been talking about uh, that I had a breakdown um, for many years now. And at first I was sort of ashamed about it um, and embarrassed. Uh, it was a shock to me to have a breakdown. I didn't think of myself as a person who would have a breakdown. And, um, but then in, in the years since I started talking about it because I wanted to share it with people so they would understand what that I what I'd been through and how yoga had helped me so much about that. So now I've been talking about it for years, and um, I've gotten you know more comfortable with that, and I realized the value the value of that. And you know basically what happened was um, I was in a very stressful situation in my life with a lot of stressful things going on. Um, my husband. I was living in a foreign country. My husband wanted to move somewhere else again. And I didn't really want to do that, but I didn't want to break up our family. My father had a stroke. You know, I had, I was caring for a baby. I had all these things going on. And I reached a point of just terrible insomnia, having terrible insomnia and um, just feeling very agitated um, and worried about things and worried about the future. So it was a kind of anxiety-based uh, condition that um, disrupted my whole life because of the, because of the sleep problems really. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, recovering from that, I made it my mission to figure out how I could prevent this from ever happening again because it was really terrible. Yeah. So that was how, you know, when I started getting involved with yoga and learning how yoga could help me stay calmer and uh, more centered and, and actually address some of the symptoms of anxiety that I tend to get um, that, you know, I started putting everything together and using yoga to prevent that from happening again, which I was successful at, I'm happy to say. So one of the things that I think makes this a timely conversation is that we're in a moment in our collective lives where um, I kind of feel sometimes that that word anxiety gets overused, but there's a lot of a sense of that things in some way, maybe for me personally, but for my community, but for my country or for my planet, that things aren't going well. And that there may be a long time before they do go well. And one lesson I think of, of, of yoga is, is that of impermanence, that you, know, you, you pass through things. But the other way that I think yoga can be used is to pass more gracefully or to pass, uh, to have some tools to go through those times. Um, Barry, do you wanna talk about that a little bit about how yoga can be used as a kind of a self management tool? Sure, sure, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I agree completely with everything that you you just said. And, and I think that, um, those tools that yoga offers us to deal with anxiety and uncertainty and the stress, it, you know, there, it's only going to become more important um, as, as time goes on, I think. And I, I think really the major way, the, the major way that the tools of yoga help us in that regard is the way they affect our nervous system. Mm 
Mm -hmm. the way they allow the chronic stress or the effects of anxiety or grief or worry, whatever, you know, challenge we might be dealing with that that disrupts um, our nervous system. And that affects our, our, our everything about our health and well-being, our immune system, our digestion, et cetera. So I think that, um, you know, the tools and practices uh, of certain asanas done in particular ways that are restful and restorative for the nervous system that are calming for the nervous system and therefore for the mind, um, as well as the, the breath practices and the, the meditative practices that that do that specifically because not all of them work that way. Um, so there's specific tools um, that we need to employ uh, to deal with the challenges of the time. In, in other words, it's not any kind of yoga that we yeah. do that's going to help. In fact, some, some types of yoga and some practices can make it worse. Um, so I think that that's really the major way that, that yoga, uh, the, the tools of yoga work uh, to support us with managing um, the the stress and anxiety that we're living through i think that's really important what barry just said because yeah. you know there's this idea among a lot of people and you know and like doctors or even people who don't know that much about yoga where they think all yoga is calming and you know we'll just do some yoga but it really isn't true there's some practices that are actually quite stimulating like doing a lot of back bends or doing a stimulating pranayama practice uh, where, which emphasizes the inhalation instead of the exhalation or um, doing really fast flow practice and so on. So, um, you know, that's one of the purposes of, of trying to learn more about what kinds of yoga help with anxiety versus what don't, because yeah, just, and you know, and I, that's what took me a while to learn too, because at first, you know, I just did yoga. Like I just went to class and did whatever. And I practiced at home and maybe I would do sun salutations and that didn't actually help. No. I, yeah. I had to learn, you it know, to you do... sleep, did it? Especially if you do them at night. Um... No, if you're <laughs> agitated, it really doesn't help calm you down. So yeah, I had to learn, you know, when I started learning, that was when, you know, just, the, you know, the sun broke through the clouds when I started learning how to do supported inversions and how they worked, you know, to mm -hmm. actually uh, calm your nervous system and reduce your stress hormones and so on that, you know, I began to like put these pieces together of like what, what kind of practices to do when, um, to help during emotional difficulties. Yeah. And I, I would just add to that, Nina, that, um, you know, one thing I love about your approach and you know, this <laughs> is that you also really emphasize that not everything is going to work for everybody. Exactly. So it's not just that here's a set of tools that are going to help you. It's about how do you, how do you help develop this? How do you develop the sensitivity and the awareness, the reflective awareness of how what you're doing affects you so that you can, you can do more of what works. So I think it's very much about offering a, a wide set of tools, a toolbox of possible uh, tools that will help and then encouraging people to get to know themselves, what works for them and take that into their lives. And even in the toolbox, understanding that the tools themselves are variable. Because one of the things that I think is really unhelpful when someone's having a kind of a emotionally charged moment is for the well-intentioned person to say, take a deep breath. If you could, if that person could take a deep breath, wouldn't they? Uh, would, would they be so emotionally charged? The other one, because I'm so glad you brought this up, that kind of makes me crazy is when people, and, and always it's well intended, but people are told that they should sit down and go deep and meditate. And that's not where their energy is. Their energy is like, um, so as a therapist, I will give people a walking meditation way before I will say, sit down, go deep. Uh, <laughs> uh, but to meet energy with the right kind of energy, what you're talking about really is understanding the moment, understanding the person, understanding the tool, all of that as an application of self-care can be extremely useful or extremely unuseful, <laughs> I think you're saying. 
<laughs> yeah, definitely. It's re it's really not a good idea to be prescriptive and say do this because you know just thinking about some of the examples you gave, you know, some people are anxious, feel even more anxious when they pay attention to their breath because like breathing yes. is such a, an essential physical uh, act of being alive that somehow turning their attention to them makes them really anxious. I had a student like that. So in his case, even teaching him calming breath practices wasn't a good idea or breath awareness wasn't a good idea because that just made him feel worse. And likewise with meditation, if uh, someone doesn't have a strong meditation practice already and they're feeling and uh, with anxiety and they're feeling very agitated, like mm -hmm. you said, sitting still is really hard. And also focusing, being alone with your thoughts can just sort of send you into an upward spiral of more stress and anxiety, you know? So that's why having a huge choice because some of those things do work for people, right? Yes. Sometimes taking a deep breath does work. Sometimes a calming breath practice does work. Sometimes meditating does calm you down if you're, especially if you're experienced at it and have a regular right. practice. So that's why having a huge range of choices is really important. And um, that's one thing that's so amazing about yoga is there's just like a whole breadth of options, you know, whether the supported inverted poses, which will calm your nervous system because you're upside down and they have this effect, this physiological effect on you, or mm -hmm. some people like restorative yoga. Some people want to do an active practice to tire themselves out from, from being so hyper and mm -hmm. then they can relax at the end of that. Um, and there's even more possibilities that I haven't mentioned yet, but that that's, I think, you know, the richness of yoga, uh, the yoga practice provides all these different options and everyone really does have a lot of choices right. and can try a bunch of things and see what works for them and, and what doesn't. Well, I think Barry mentioned something really important on that vein, which was self-study, which was cultivating the ability to understand what your needs are, or even with help to get a sense of what would be helpful and what would be not helpful in a, in a given situation. Yeah, like noticing how things affect you. Like one of the techniques Nina didn't mention that really helps me when I'm feeling anxious is like stretching my hips and doing standing poses. Like that just really works that, for me. There's that a few would, poses that would like, occur to anybody that that would be helpful. Yeah, and there's just some, there's a just connection I made <laughs> after all these years that, oh, if I stretch my outer hip in this particular way, it just helps me so much to feel calmer in the moment you know, when I could do it. I, yeah. The other thing I'd like you to just talk about a little bit is, is um, for me personally, as a yoga therapist, what I try to do with my clients is get literally get them out of their head, like have them focus on the bottom. So they get them as far away from their head as possible. Um, because a lot of what's going on with situations, I hate to use the word anxiety, because I feel like that's a a specific term and what a lot of people have is an agitated mind or they have a restlessness or they're not feeling, maybe all of that is anxiety, but what's going on a lot is mind churn, like, like persistent thinking about what's gonna happen or how can I control that? Or, and I think that putting other words, even using, uh, which is really an underused, uh, I think practice in yoga of, of, of different words, of just replacing those churny words with a mindfully, you know, loving kindness words or uh, chanty words, or, you know, can you just talk a little bit about the, the way that you can kind of tweak what's going on in, our, in, in a person's mind, not, not you, but how, how I as a practitioner might be able to do that? Um, yeah, I can. Um, but first of all, I'd like to address your issue of saying that you think the word anxiety is overused. I don't really think it is. I think if anyone says they feel anxious, we, we should, you know, accept that. And just there's a huge spectrum of what anxiety is. That's what I mean. That's what it's yeah. a little bit am, ambiguous what it means, because there's so many situations that you could apply it to. I'm, I'm not saying it's 
overused. I'm saying there are so many situations. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. So there's a kind of mild anxiety, you know, that people might be having that's not actually disrupting their lives. Um, You know, they're just worrying about the future constantly or too much and that's bothering them or maybe their sleep's a little disruptive or something or maybe their digestion's a little off because they're feeling kind of stressed out and then you know there's an extreme which you know is what happened to me when I actually had a breakdown because you know I just became it it, it reached a point where I couldn't really function normally in my life so I just like to point that out that, that there's this this spectrum but um you know and I think when you reach the end of the spectrum, the breakdown, and then you really should get some professional help. Well, but that's not- what, yeah, that's yeah. what I wasn't meaning to denigrate the term. I was right. just meaning to say it's become very broad, especially since the pandemic and other things that are going on. Uh, haven't a lot more people come into either a chronic or a low grade level of being worried a lot. And I think it is helpful um, in some ways to get more specific about what you're feeling, because I I do, you know, it's like, I'll say for myself, I'm feeling anxious, but what is it really? You know, it's like Nina gave some example. Am I worried? Am I scared? You know, is it this particular situation? So I do think it can be helpful in that regard to um, just for the sake of clarity, get more clear on what you're actually feeling, because I agree that it can be a little bit vague. And we just tend to say, oh, I'm feeling anxious. And then going a little bit deeper into what that act- what that feeling actually is and how it's manifesting for us, I think can give us insight. And, and also maybe help to choose which tools are gonna be helpful because yes. you're, you're getting a better understanding. Um, Nina, could you talk though a little bit about, because you brought it up and I think it's really important Um, Sometimes we think this is just the way it is, but actually we need to go get some mental health support. We need to, it's not, it it, it isn't necessarily the way it is. We are really past the point of being able to just deal with it on our own. Is there a role for yoga to play in us helping to determine, you know what, I'm really, I really need some outside help right now. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, I don't really have a specific answer to that, except for, as Barry said, um, being more self-reflective and kind of taking some time to explore how you're really feeling and um, explore what physical symptoms you're having, because I think those are important. You know, if you reach a point like where you, you know, can't eat anymore, you know, can't sleep anymore night after night after night and so on. You know, those, those in particular, those, those kinds of symptoms uh, are, or are you having panic attacks? So, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to think a lot about it. going, in other words, too. outside of the realm of just kind of worrying about things. Right, or, right. Like interfering, so, yeah. can we say interfering with daily life? Yeah, you know, absolutely. With, sleep, with eating, with- right regular function You're being able to function being able to go to work and do your job or you know take care of your family or whatever, or whatever it is that that you're feeling i mean i think that's that's a, a, a signal that you need help now saying that you can still use yoga as a supplement as an adjunct therapy or medication or anything like that it's re- can be really effective um so they work really well together and and I, I just want people to um, understand that if they do need medication or therapy or something else besides yoga, there's no shame in that. And they should be grateful for both whatever modern yeah. medicine, therapy, yoga, all of it, because all West. those things can work together. Yeah. The yoga can give you, what's really important about the yoga is that you're helping yourself. So that's what's different about seeking outside help, medication, therapy, that's getting outside help. And it's really empowering to help yourself Mm -hmm. um, by practicing yoga for anxiety. And then when you're through your episode, you can keep on practicing to prevent future episodes. And that's hugely powerful. Obviously that changes your life because not having these disruptive episodes again, you know, is amazing. So that's how they work hand in hand. 
So you two are co-teaching a class for us, which we're kind of excited about, because again, I think the timing is perfect for this. I don't know if that was the plan, but <laughs> there is a lot, of, a lot of need for some understanding of how to cope in some of these tools. So you're going to be teaching a course called Finding Your Center of Calm, Essential Yoga Self-Care Tools for Anxiety. Can you tell us, uh, will you be helping us to understand some of these self, uh, self-reflection self tools, some of the poses that you were talking about, some of the practices, just what's in the course? <laughs> well, general enough? I, can, I can start out, Nina, and then you can, okay. you can comment. Um, the course, it's, it, well, it, the, the whole first part of the course is about tools to ma- understanding what anxiety is and tools to manage anxiety in the moment. Mm -hmm. And then it's about how to manage chronic stress because chronic stress is what is a major cause of anxiety. So there's the short term, you know, in the moment approach, and then there's the the longer term practices that you can do and and we explain how those work. And then do you wanna talk about the second part? Oh, sure. And then the second half is about preventing anxiety from reoccurring. So I, I just mentioned that when I was just talking about that, that as being a really powerful side of things. So in, the, in that section, we talk about um, sort of uh, keeping your stress levels low on a regular basis, lowering your baseline stress level, because um, what happens is if your baseline stress level is high all the time because you're in a mild state of chronic stress, I said, it's like pouring tea into a cup that already has tea in it. It just Mm -hmm. overflows. You go over the edge, you go into anxiety. But if you keep your baseline stress levels lower, then if a stressful thing happens to you, um, you can, you know, handle it much more effectively because you've got, you know, room in your system for handling a little more stress and there's room in your teacup for a little more stress. The word that came to my mind when you were saying that is you were a little more resilient. You can It's not that we can't control what's going on. This is becoming extremely clear. We can't control what's going on, but we can come back from those stressors faster if we practice when we're not under stress. I guess that would be the- Right, that's right. Now, one thing I think is really helpful that you've done is you're doing two practices, not just one. Is that right? So two different practices for just for different occasions, Barry, what are the- Yeah, so the first one is an active grounding practice and that incorporates some of the tools that we talk about, um, about how to manage anxiety when it comes up in the moment. So Mm -hmm. as you spoke about um, earlier in the conversation, it's very much about getting you out of your head and down into your legs and your feet. Because I actually think that that's, you know, there's ways we can work with the churning thoughts that you mentioned. And I think, you know, in asana, one of the most effective ways is by doing standing poses and poses that you know, work the legs and ground the feet and focusing on the foundation of the feet, just kind of taking the mind into the lower body in that way. So the first, um, the first practice is an active grounding practice and we use the wall for um, even more stability uh, in that practice. And then the second practice is a calming practice where we do uh, supported inversions and we explain why, how those work and why they're so effective and relaxing. Um, for you, even if your mind, even, even, you don't even have to do anything with your mind per se, you just have to be in the position. So we explain the the reasoning for that uh, in the course. And so then that, that's the second practice. It's a more calming, calming practice. And I think we should say just in case people don't know this, that a supported inversion is not a headstand. It's Correct. (laughs) You're not upside down, (laughs) hanging from a tree. Yeah. Um, Just head below the heart. (laughs) Unless you want to, right? <laughs> Unless you want to. But the, the other thing we're doing in the course that I really love is we're bringing in some of the perspectives of yoga philosophy, some of the principles that people can start to work with, again, to develop that more reflective capacity, to develop a broader perspective mm-hmm. um, on how to deal with anxiety, not just the physical um, approach, but really bringing in kind of the, the, the more... Um, some of the more inward practices as well. Awesome. 
Well, yeah, that's finding your center that addresses your the issue you raised earlier about how you let go of thoughts. Besides being in your body in asana, there's a lot of techniques. I call them yogic um, yoga tools for with, for working with your thoughts. So it's part of yoga philosophy, but I like to kind of separate it out that way. So you know, teaching people how to actually let go of thoughts that they notice that are not helpful to them. So, you know, first of all, you can evaluate when you're having a feeling of fear or anxiety, like, is that helpful to you? Is there some action you need to take? Because sometimes you do, there's sometimes, you know, you have, a, a, you need to solve a problem or even take to social activism to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. But sometimes there's nothing you can do about it and you're just having anxiety and spinning. So yeah. how can you then, after you've, you know, done that um, soul searching or self-reflection, how can you then let go of those thoughts and emotions? And then there's active tools for that, like cultivating the opposite, you know, by replacing the thoughts you're having with, with, uh, with other thoughts. Um, and just ways, other ways of letting go, like, you know, Excellent. letting go with your breath or uh, picturing an image of letting go of that thought um, and so on. So that's Excellent. a big part of the second half because those help you train you with techniques that you can use to um, kind of defuse situations and like cut off like the spiral of anxious mm -hmm. thoughts that are starting up. Yeah. Awesome. So finding your center of calm, I'm reading off my screen, <laughs> essential yoga, self-care tools for anxiety, because I want to get it right. It sounds like a wonderful class. Looking forward to tuning in. And thank you both so much for all this information. I think it'll be super helpful for this moment in our lives. So thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Lynn. Bye, everybody. Bye.